Perfect. All right, so we should be all set up and ready to go. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. This is the Exploring Dance Culture version 2.0. Um, my name is Heather. I'm going to be hosting today. Um, I'm super, super excited. I'm going to try not to say um too many more times, <laughs> um, but it's going to be it's going to be fantastic. So we are we are going to get into it. Um, before we do, I would like to start with something really important, and that is a land acknowledgement. Um, I know a lot of us are familiar with these. If you're not, please make yourself familiar. Um, I recognize this is a little tricky as we're probably scattered all over the place right now, um, especially with, with COVID doing this virtually. Um, but I would just like to encourage you to always in your, your living and working and studying and dancing lives to be thinking about where you are and the significance and the relevance of it um, and how that shapes your current relationship with the land and other people's relationship with the land um, around you. So yeah, like I said, we're all in, in different places. I know some people are in Alberta, so that's um, a lot of that uh, native uh, territory is like Blackfoot and Cree and Sarsi um, and, and a lot of other things. So I encourage you to look into that. I'm gonna do an acknowledgement based on uh, UBC since we're a UBC based club. Um, so we are speaking today, I'm presenting from the tra traditional, ancestral, and unceded. Um, and unceded, if you don't know what that means, uh, that's totally okay. It just means that the land was never legally signed over to the Crown or the Canadian government. Um, and so it's the territory of the Musqueam peoples that we are on. Um, and Musqueam people are one of various like culturally and linguistically distinct nations that comprise the Coast Salish uh, group. Um, and the Coast Salish occupies most of BC as well as down into the, um, the further coast. Uh, Vancouver specifically is Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh territories are, are some of the main ones. Um, and it's just really important for us to recognize the colonial and discriminatory and racist practices that have taken place on this land and they continue to, continue to oppress indigenous communi communities. Um, so I just wanna acknowledge that UBC is built on this land and directly continues often to, to perpetrate some of these practices. So I just want us to be really aware and keep a really critical mind um, when we're doing land acknowledgements and just throughout our lives. Um, and also be aware that land acknowledgement is a super important step, but it's just a first step. So there's a lot of, a lot of work to be continued off of that. Um, if you don't know what land you're on, I'm gonna put a little link in the chat here. You may have seen this before. It is an awesome resource where you can basically just put in your address and it will tell you exactly whose land you're on. Um, so that's a cool thing to check out. All right, um, without further ado, um, keeping that in mind moving forward. Thank you everyone again for being here. I know I've said that a million times, but I know we're all super Zoom fatigued. Um, I'm Zoom, fatigue, Zoom fatigued. It's a really hard time of year. Um, so I just really appreciate you tuning in. Um, it means a lot. It's, it's really awesome. Um, I'll give you a little rundown of sort of how the day is going to go. We'll let our awesome speakers introduce themselves, which I'm really excited for. Um, but I just want to set up sort of a tone for the event today. Um, I want to note that this is a conversational discussion, so it's going to be hopefully quite fluid. Um, you can pop in with a lot of questions. We have some really knowledgeable speakers and panelists, and I see a lot of awesome faces in the audience too that I know have a lot to share. So uh, we're super excited. Um, that being said, like, don't feel afraid to ask questions, but I just want to emphasize that this is a safe place and a judgment-free space for learning, for sharing experiences, for being curious and questioning. Um, and that while we're doing all of that, it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay, that's how we learn, um, but that disrespect will not be tolerated. Um, I don't think that's gonna be an issue. All of you are wonderful, but just know that any, any disrespectful um, or discriminatory or 
hurtful speech will not be tolerated by me. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, that being said, yeah, so we're just gonna, we're gonna, I'll introduce myself, our speakers will introduce themselves so you can get to know them a little bit. Um, and then we'll get to the discussion going. Um, and then at the end, I have a little trivia Kahoot game that I put together just for something a little interactive and fun because I know it's a long time to sit. Um, and we have some potential prizes associated with that at the end too. So I'll tell you about that. It's gonna be fun. Um, yeah, I'll introduce myself and then I will pass over speaking so you don't <laughs> have to listen to me anymore. Uh, my name is Heather McNichol. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, so feel free when you're talking about yourself, if you would like to use your pronouns, we highly encourage that, um, but there's no pressure either way. Um, I've been affiliated with Dance Horizons for the past five years. I don't feel old enough for that to be true, but <laughs> um, yeah, so it's been a really wonderful experience and it's a club that I really love. Um, Dance Horizons is a UBC based club. It's been around for 35 years um, and it strives to bring, like we strive to bring different styles of dance to a whole range of people, um, no matter what your level is, anywhere from beginner to advanced. Um, we try to really keep it um, varied and we hire professional teachers. And so they're always really awesome. And um, yeah, it's just, it's a really fantastic club and fantastic place to be. And so Dance Horizons is um, putting on this event today and I am just hosting it. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have about that. I'm gonna let Campbell really quickly introduce himself. He's gonna help me with monitoring the chat today. Um, so if you have questions, um, you can either directly, like you can put them in the chat, you can direct message myself or Campbell um, if you wanna be anonymous and we can ask them on your behalf. You can also just raise your hand, that little function that does that as well. Um, we should be able to see it and help you out there. And of course, speakers like feel free to be like, oh, so-and-so has a question. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, but it's Campbell and I will handle it. So we don't want you to be too distracted by it. Um, we'll cover that for you, anything that's missed. Um, yeah, you wanna say hi, Campbell? Yeah, hi everyone. So I'm Campbell. I'm a second year here at UBC and I'm also an events executive with UBC Dance Horizons. Um, yeah, so again, as Heather mentioned, you can either direct message me or Heather, any questions you have, pop them in the chat and we will speak on your behalf if you want us to do that. But yeah, I'm looking really forward to learning alongside the rest of you today. Awesome, thank you. Perfect. Um, now for the more exciting part, I will <laughs> stop speaking so much. Would our, any of our speakers like to start by introducing themselves? Um, tell us anything, your name, what you do, anything you'd like. Um, I'll start. Perfect, thank you. Cool, uh, I'm AJ Megaman, uh, African name Kule Mashkul Kambere. Whoops, my bad. Um, I've been dancing for 18 years, originally from Surrey, living on Vancouver Island now. I'm part of a dance crew called Heavy Hitters and uh, an international dance crew called Soulbotics. Uh, I I'm a hip hop um, educator, instructor, and teacher and dancer. And when uh, and I'm also a street dancer as well, from popping to Memphis jerking to hip hop to animation to some indombolo. Um, and gumbo dance, which some people know as, as stepping. Uh, I also teach hip hop history classes. I do online classes and I'm just here to share my knowledge, my truth to you guys. So yeah, that's me. Amazing, thank you so much. We're super, super excited to have you. Um, yeah, we're thrilled. Can anybody else introduce themselves? Sure. Thanks, Sabrina. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi. So my name is Sabrina Naz Kamenescu. I am a dancer based out of Calgary, Alberta. And um, my background is in Caribbean folk, 
dance hall in Soka, and I'm currently a dancer with Decidedly Jazz Dance Works, which is a concert jazz dance company here in Calgary. And um, yeah, just like AJ said, you know, I'm here to share. I'm really excited for this conversation and um, to learn from my fellow speakers here today. Cool. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Sabrina. We're so happy to have you back. Uh, Sabrina was on the panel last term as well. So we've got a mix of new and returning faces and we're really happy about that. Um, would anyone else like to introduce themselves next? Hi, um, <clears throat> Clement. My name is um, half of Sinbad. Um, I have been dancing for a long time on uh, the uh, street wise, um, but as choreography goes and you know structured dancing and classes, I've been doing that for four years now. Um, we're now getting into the space where we want to teach and educate, so we uh currently learning from other instructors and kind of seeing uh what works in terms of like uh teaching people about your culture and how to structure that um so i'm excited to be here uh to learn from you guys um, and have a conversation as uh, sabrina mentioned so looking forward to it Awesome. Thank you, Clement. Clement is also a full time student. We are actually <laughs> in the same class. We're actually in the so same he's class. <laughs> yeah, he's really taken like the time out of his life. So I appreciate that. Uh, awesome. Maybe we can hear from Serge, the other half of Simber. It's only natural. <laughs> right. So, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Serge Birute. Um, same as Clement, you know, we. Uh, we are doing uh, Afrobeat slash dance hall and are trying to step into the space of being instructors, um, which, you know, has had its own challenges. And there's been a lot of great things that we've learned and hopefully could share some of them today. Um, we are both from Kenya, but uh, for those of you who don't know, we actually did not meet in Kenya. We met here through a mutual friend and that was about four and a half, about five years ago. And uh, shortly after that, we started Sinbirds because you know, we just found uh, so much in common with each other and here we are. So happy to be here. Thank you so much, Heather, for hosting us and uh, excited. Super happy to have you guys. Thank you for coming back. We appreciate it. We're excited. Yo, my name is AJ, AJ Masodi, originally from Calgary, Calgary, Alberta, but I now live in Vancouver. Still going back and forth. My mom still lives in Alberta, so gotta go back and visit all the time. Um, I am a school uh, educator. I do residencies. So I teach cultural competency in the school system from K all the way to high school. And I also do um, acknowledgement of diversity within classrooms and dance programs and different studios, which has been really, really different this year. Uh, prior to that, I was doing a lot of choreography training and a lot of uh, fundamental training still in the basis of hip hop dance and kind of playing around with um, some Afro dances as well. But a lot of my work uh, these past, um, this past year and a half has been really um, getting the chance to have awesome conversations. So even just being here today, like I'm super, super excited and I feel very comfortable um, in these types of environments to just share and learn off of people. And I don't know, to me, I find it really interesting that the conversation we're having right now is always centered around understanding other people understanding different people and even as you look in this chat i know like we're spotlighted but as i was looking at everyone we all look so different like there's so many different people from different places from different cultures from different influences from different backgrounds and that's exactly it it's just that acknowledgement of the room so i'm just excited to learn off of everybody and thank you again heather and the horizons team let's go thank you so much aj aj is like is such a phenomenal um, I hate to use the word resource, but really you're such like a wealth of knowledge and, and awesome stuff. And we just enjoy having you so much as a human too. So thank you for coming back and for being here. Awesome. Last but certainly not least, Isa, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. 
Yeah, hi guys. Uh, I'm Isaac Asangro. Most people know me as Aizo, which is short of Isaac. Uh, born and raised in Rwanda, Africa. I uh, moved here 2014 and just missed dance. I just missed my my uh, my African dance when I was here. I figured that there is no is lack of representation of African dance and decided to start my own dance company called Afrobeat Dance Van. Check it out, British African Dance. So yeah, that's what I've been doing and trying to promote basically the African culture through dance and entertainment. Yeah, that's me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Izo. Yeah, Izo does a lot of super cool work around Vancouver. If you're here, definitely check him out. Um, can vouch for him for sure. He's awesome. <laughs> so we're super happy to have him as a new voice this semester on the panel. Um, yeah, so I won't uh, won't talk for too long. We can just sort of get it going. Um, for anybody who, uh, just a little bit of context, I guess. Um, last semester was the first time that we had this panel. Um, so this is somewhat a continuation, but it's not gonna be a repeat by any means. Um, a, that would be boring for our, for our speakers. Um, and there's just so much to talk about that we're really gonna kind of let it go um, in whatever direction it needs to go. So um, I guess I'll give you like a teeny bit of context for sort of where my thought process was going with this, but, and then we'll just start with some questions and, uh, and get the discussion flowing. Um, yeah, the, the purpose of these panels is to to uplift to, to bring education to a the ubc community and anybody who wants to join um you know like it, it's it's free and so we just want to be able to bring in voices of people with different knowledge different experiences to bring their cultural understanding um and how like how we can share that and uplift that um through dance and another thing that I really thought would be interesting sort of to talk about AJ and I were sort of talking about this beforehand um, is intersectionality that's a big big term um, and I am not an expert I am also learning a million things every day especially on this panel um, but how you know like where you come from versus where like what dance styles are accessible to you? Um, how does maybe the way you look play into dance or does it not? Um, do you feel like you learn things all equally to everybody else? And what kind of ways can we celebrate the roots and the culture and honor that when we're branching out in new dance styles that maybe we don't know? Um, and how can we keep those conversations and keep that learning always alive and going. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm really just, this is sort of just me sort of percolating. Um, so I would like to start with, maybe we'll just get a, a question put out to the panelists and, and anyone can answer it and we'll go from there. That sounds good to everybody. Awesome. Um, so I guess my first, our first question would be, what are some ways um, in which you personally celebrate and incorporate the cultural roots of either the dance style you teach um, or the dance style you're, you're most familiar with or that you're really passionate about? How do you honor the culture and honor the roots? And yeah, I guess that's the question. <laughs> I mean, I can start with that. If if, I, if everyone's cool with that, I can start with that. Um, for me, I actually was just, uh, I was talking to the people, my, the dancers that I teach um, at various studios about this this whole week. Uh, the best way for me personally, and I think many other people should do, uh, which isn't done enough, is appreciating the culture. And what I mean by appreciating the culture is number one, on, every time you learn something do not plagiarize and everyone should know about what plagiarizing is because we all have been to university or high school 
at some point and plagiarizing is copying something and not giving credit to the source. And this is something that has been done multiple times and it is done actually heavily on TikTok uh, where you'll see a lot of people from the African diaspora will be sharing their dances and then uh, the big white collared uh, companies will come and find the most popular uh, male or female doing that dance and they will a not get the creators and if they don't that's step one get the creators if you're trying to get the proper learn how to the dance and if you don't step two is those who were gotten to go and teach those dance to always give credit where credit is due so that is it is so important anytime i teach a dance style I'm always like, this is where it came from. Here are the originators. This is how it started. And I, and I, as a, histor a history major as well, it's also important not to tell the history of the dance styles in a biased sense. What I mean by a bias in, in history, whenever you study anything in history, you have to bring two perspectives. So you have one area of history. This is where it starts. This is where the dance style, let's say popping started. Fresno, California. Let's just use this as an example. And then you have to say the other side of the history where other people believe that popping came from Oakland, the Bay Area, California. So you can't just go and say this is one or the other. You have to tell the whole history. And this is something that needs to be done more. And I feel like the best way to uplift the culture is anytime you're teaching, whether it's a just step, a hip hop step, a locking step, know who created it, know where it came from. And just, even if you're teaching a routine, like, and it's not your routine, even just saying, this is not my routine, this is from so-and-so and I'm teaching it to you guys. That is very important. And yeah, that's, that what I think is the bare minimum that should be done and would be very great to uplift the culture. Next. Um, I'd like to bounce off of that, if that's okay. I think sometimes um, we hear we hear amazing, amazing intel in, insight like that. And right away from me even looking up to Mega Man, I know that that's years and years and years of his work and development and study and investment in his craft, right? So I, I can feel the energy and that pressure of almost being like, well, that feels like a lot to be able to do and interject in my class. But there, there are really ways where it doesn't have to feel that pressuring, right? Especially if we're doing um, a really important part of our job as teachers, which is being in service of our students. In you trying to uplift your student, you could interject history. Um, for example, if I'm teaching my grade fours and we're doing like the Bismarck key, and there's one student who's in the back who's adding their own flair, adding their own style, I could take a moment in class to get everyone to take a second to encourage that student and clap for that student. And I could say, I really appreciated how you were being an individual and adding your own style. That really reminds me of Bismarck Key, who looked different, but regardless, still interjected his own style and was doing his own thing. He didn't let that affect him. So he was having fun with that movement. So now you're talking about history, you're talking about the movement, and you can uplift the student all at the same time. But it's integrating it within the conversation that you're having. When you're focusing on, okay, I'm trying to put as many moves as possible, or I'm trying to focus on getting moves that I know are like historical moves, and we're kind of like engineering it in a certain way, then it can feel like a lot. But having that organic conversation and speaking of the names that are responsible for what has been created in relevant ways with the students is like a very, very simple way as AJ Megaman was saying, like to just incorporate that in your classroom, but using it to, again, uplift your students at the same time. So that's just something that I've been using over the years to mesh both, if, if that kind of makes sense. You hit it on the nail, bro, straight up. Like that's- Learning, learning, man. That's, that's exactly, you know, that's it. It shouldn't feel heavy. It shouldn't feel hard. You know, guys who, who asked the question, it's honestly, 
like, all right, guys, uh, I'm going to teach you guys uh, a hip hop routine, uh, but a routine that's going to be heavily influenced in the Harlem Shake. And just so you know, the Harlem Shake originated from Harlem and it originated back in the 90s. And it was in the uh, streets of when the females were doing the Harlem Shake back uh, on the streets and the graffiti artists. So, yeah, that's a little bit of history of the Harlem Shake. All right, now let's go. Like, it took not even 30 seconds. <laughs> it's it's such a quick thing that, you know, it's our job to educate as teachers and we need to educate. And it's it's the student's job to challenge, call them out if they don't know their information. It's good to call them out on it because then you're up, you're keeping the teachers accountable. And this is, that should just be the bare minimum. So yeah, good on you, uh, AJ from Calgary, boom. Yeah, AJ and AJ, wow, just gems, I love it. Um, you know, these are social dance forms that we are all a part of. So I think we should definitely tap into that, that social aspect. And I think it's very okay to keep these classes conversational. Um, sometimes, I mean, I've noticed and I've even taken classes where, you know, we go in to class and the teacher doesn't say a thing. And that is a method and that's strong. Um, and then there's also a method of conversating and educating and taking the time to just communicate with your students because really that's what they need the most. Um, when I think of, you know, how you put it, Heather, cultural roots, like I think of the word roots and what do you get from roots? You get information nourishment, support, like these are all the things that we can tap into while we are communicating with our students um, because we need these things in dance. So I guess what I'm doing here, I'm just echoing you two, but ultimately it is so important to um, have that acknowledgement of cultural roots. And how do you get into that? is getting into the history of the dance style. Dig deeper. Um, right now in DJD, we're doing a lot of, in our jazz classes, we're doing a lot of Betsy work, which is um, kind of like a subgenre to jazz, uh, very kind of a funky approach. And there's a whole history around that. And I'm making it a point to go up to my teachers at this level and having conversations um, to understand, well, where does this technique within jazz come from? Because it clearly, there's a connection to funk, right? And I'm very interested in that connection and the reverence towards that connection. So ultimately, keep it conversational in the classes. That's the best way we can pass along information. Fire, Sabrina. Fire. Straight fire. Blah, 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 blah. That was, yeah, so, so insightful. I have a, a bit of a follow-up question. Because um, I, I know a lot of the people here that I can see that are uh, watching and listening today, um, some of them are sort of branching into teaching. I don't know everyone's individual history as a student, because all of you with all of our, our speakers, with all of the knowledge that you have are teachers and educators, but also students yourselves, I would imagine, um, in many, like with continual learning, right? Like, I don't know, maybe that's just my perspective, but we're, we're always learning, right? That's what we're doing right now. That's what we're doing here is we're learning from each other and, and giving and receiving. And so I guess it's more of a situational question when you go into classes, as it seems like has happened, and I know I've experienced where you don't feel that maybe the teacher knows their history or has done their research or has paid their dues. Um, as a student, how do you handle that? I guess, maybe how should you or, or how have you? Um, aside from, I guess, you know, going out on your own time and being like, hey, I should, uh, I should look into this. I don't know. I've done that before where I'm like, I've done this movie a million times and I don't know what it's called and no one's telling me. So I guess I'll go to YouTube. Um, but how, like what other ways would, would you approach that in that kind of setting? That's a good question. 
Uh, uh, that's a very good question. And I'm smiling as you ask that question because this happens numerous, numerous times. And I've taken class before where I'm learning to step and I'm the first person to put my hand up and be like, who created the move? And if the teacher says, I don't know, then that's that's enough right there. That That is enough for the teacher to be like, oh, damn. Because it is our job as students, we're always learning, keep the teachers accountable. It, it's all it is, is just a question. Like, oh, do you, where did this move come from? Because I want to get more history on it. Uh, if the teacher doesn't know, they'll either point you in the direction to someone who does it well, uh, or they'll just be like, I don't know, it's just the move I created, you know, and that's okay too. But it's, <laughs> you just got to ask that question and not to be afraid to ask the question in class, obviously with respect, you know, don't just come up and be like, this is trash. Like, what are you doing? Like, tell me, the, no, you don't do that. Just it's it's very important as a child. We as children we ask questions so much, and the older we get, we get nervous to ask questions. Why? Just ask. <laughs> That's it. That was a great. That was an awesome answer. Yeah, it, that makes sense. Thank you so much, and I, I loved your point about respect being. Yes, I'm... Yeah, go ahead. As... I, I I I I'm good basically listening to what you guys are, are saying and, and this is from experience like like I, I know like how you, you should tell your student the, the, the history and the origin of the dance style after teaching a few a few years of afro I realized that I keep I keep keep, keep reteaching the same group let's say we're doing the guara guara and I'm like this is guara guara it's from Ghana no it's from South Africa I repeat again this is guara guara it's from South Africa Next day or next class, I come in and do the program. Like, what is this again? They all look at me like, mm, we don't know. <laughs> and we've been doing that week after week, and I've been explaining it and telling this story. And I realized that sometimes what you just say, what you, 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 you tell the student, they just go in here and just leaves. You know what I mean? Because they just that just to dance, to have a good time. Sometimes they don't care about the history and what all that kind of that jazz. So I developed this system where like, I ask them questions or I encourage them to do some research on their own. I'm like, hey, next class, we're doing, a, we're doing some mandobo. So we're doing some loketo. This is the word, this is how you spell the word. Please go home, do some research. Next class, I want you to tell me something about the country this comes from or any favorite or big star that sings this kind of stuff, you know, sing some dombolo, any famous dombolo, artist right so when i come come back next class we, we warm up we stretch and i'm like all right who has answers for me you know it feels like a homework but it also like sticks because because they do their own research right it's not like today i came in i learned some guara guara i go home cook do some other stuff the next the next time i come in and i don't remember what we did last time you know what i mean so encourage them ask them some questions encourage them to do their own homework or own research that's very, very helpful. Uh, Izo. Facts, Izo, facts, that's dope. I just want to say, brother, uh, I really appreciate you sharing that because that frustration, it, it, it can feel heavy, right? Because it's different when you're sharing a part of yourself consistently on a daily basis, right? At the end of the day, we can talk about how it feels like students are just there to have fun or maybe they're not remembering. But for the teacher, when you're teaching, that takes a lot out of you. It takes a lot out of us, right? It feels like this fight that you're fighting isn't, isn't going anywhere. Or it even feels like a part of yourself is not important. And, and I'm speaking from something that I, that I connect to very, very deeply because the more I've been sharing uh, things that have been close to me culturally, and I've been able to see people's reaction to it. It has brought back trauma from me growing up in school and not wanting to show my cultural background in school because of seeing the reaction that it would get. Like, I, th I, think, um, I think something that's very important here, and Heather, you kind of mentioned it earlier, um, and Izo, you touched on it is dance just for fun, right? Is dance just for fun? 
I think dance is for fun. But a follow-up question that pops up in my mind is, who is it fun for? And if we change from the word fun and use escape, that might make, make a little more sense. Because when we have passions, when we tap into art, it is an escape, an escape of reality, right? Dance is an escape of reality. It's a new form of expression. But if you look at it, it's an, it's an escape of reality because through the time, dance has been a way for people who have felt oppressed to have a new way of expressing themselves, to have a, an environment that made them feel safe. We could think about the LGBTQ community and vogue balls and ballroom culture that's specifically created to allow a certain group of people that have a different story than my story, than your story maybe, but to allow them to express themselves freely, to do so in a safe environment. If you're thinking about b-boys, it's that same thing. A cipher and a breaking competition was meant for those kids to express themselves in that way. African dance is, is that same idea. It's, it's that escape. It's the escape for people. Now, when other, when other people get to enjoy these dances that don't specifically pertain to these groups, there's nothing wrong with it. But what has been happening is that we're forgetting who this escape was for and from what. We have to ask ourselves that question, what is the escape from, right? Because it's very, it's, it can be very clear, right? If you look at history and AJ, you were mentioning this before, I got this from Serge as well. And Sabrina, when you speak, it's very, very clear. The love of history and looking into history will really show you the things that have been happening. And it's interesting that similar things are happening right now. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of sadness. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of loss. But mainly there's a lot of trauma that's being carried, right? And out of all, out of all these things that are being, out of all these things that are happening in the world, out of all these negative things, out of all this pressure, depending on how you're going through it, out of all this pressure, beautiful things are created. If we go back to the 60s, those horrible things that was happening in the United States in the 60s is what instigated the pressure that was necessary for hip hop to then start to happen in the 70s. And historically, that's always how it's been. If you look at a lot of the independence, um, the days that a lot of countries in Africa were gaining their independence, it was through the 50s and the 60s. And if you look at what was happening in music, there were big changes in music. There were big changes in art. There were big changes in how the world was connecting to this art. So I just think when we're looking at um, if dance is supposed to be fun and what it's supposed to be about, I 100% think it is supposed to be fun, but we really need to acknowledge what our place is depending on your connection to this dance, depending on how you connect to this dance, depending on, on your background, depending on who you are, right? Because we all have a different background. So if this is a space that isn't meant to keep me safe, it wasn't meant to keep me safe specifically, it was meant to keep another group safe, then me being in there, I am now a guest. So all I can do is respect this space because there are also spaces that hold that same safety and comfort for me in different areas. Right? Again, going back to the idea of all of us being so different. We all have different privileges. We all come in with different strengths. So that's something that um, just hangs um, on me heavily. It's just understanding what cultural dances really are for people and not just seeing it as just the dance. Because when we see it as just the dance, then we can treat it however. But when you relate it to what it really is, which is a reflection of the people, you can't just toss around people that easily. You can't just treat people how you would if it was just something that belonged to everyone. We have to respect it in a different way, right? So that, that's just something I wanna, I wanna put up. AJ said about things come from pressure, diamonds are formed from pressure, yeah. boom. And um, that, that last little part, I, um, that's something that Venom actually, um, one of my mentors, an, an amazing, amazing mentor, really, really got me to think. And it's just the, the relationship between dance and culture and ancestors. 
you only have dance because of culture. We only have culture because of ancestors. Ancestors decided what was important and what traditions were important to be passed on to the next generation. Without the ancestors, we wouldn't have any of these cultural dances today because they decided what needed to be passed on. They decided what stories needed to be passed on. Same as dance. The only reason we have ballet today, which is from the 1500s, is because that story has been passed on from generation to generation to generation. But it starts with the people first. The people decide, then it becomes culture or a social norm, and then it becomes something that we attach to our history. So just, just to throw that out there to clarify um, that little point, because that's something that Venom left me with, and it has really helped me understand uh, the connection between dance and culture. Bars, wow. Um, I guess um, I beat you to the punch. Um, sorry, um, mine. Well, I I think I think there's been a lot of great points, and just to touch up on what AJ has said, um, like that importance, that that hierarchy that you have straight from the dance all the way back to the ancestors. Uh, I, I have a question for the panelists, maybe some of the um, um, attendees can also weigh in, is do we see a world where our particular dance styles, be it uh, Afrobeats, hip hop, uh, dance hall, jazz, do we see a point in our, in our future where that dance will become, will basically almost like envelop the whole world and become like for everybody? Like that st status that ballet has where with a proper training, nobody would really question what your skin tone is or what your right is in teaching that. Do we see a world where Afrobeats, dance hall, soca get there? I mean, hip hop's almost there, but uh, it, it'll take uh, it'll blank plus three, Hundred millennia and the cheeseburger for that to fully happen, in my opinion. So yeah, <laughs> I, I pose a follow-up question: Do we think that humans on Earth will agree on that same basis, just in terms of understanding each other's walks of life? Because when I think of that question, I think of like hip hop, hip hop dance. Right? There's a lot of pain. Are people willing to say, "Hey"? I acknowledge that I may have brought my own trauma to bring you pain, and I would like to apologize for that. And while I'm doing this dance, I wanna, I wanna acknowledge that and, and move on from that. Because I think when we're looking at other dances like ballet, there's just a respect to it, right? There's a respect that has been given to it. And like personally, I think in real life, people are gonna to have to have conversation and unlearn. And I don't, I think to make everyone com comfortable and understand where I'm coming from, I, I mean specifically like for me personally, I had to really work on my personal anti-blackness, my own self-hatred. So that's what I mean, for people to all be able to come together and enjoy these dances, enjoy these things that are cultural things on that even playing field, then we need to be able to do that unlearning so we can understand each other as people. Because if we don't understand each other as people, we're not willing to, then I don't think so because these dances are created because people need to express themselves. I'm gonna throw that to Nathan because yeah, look like you're raising your hand on the side. I feel like, yeah, that's that's definitely a good point. I feel like with, with, conversation, with conversations and stuff like this, there's definitely like a chance that that can be spread like more and more people will end up understanding, but because like dance, especially now is like also like a form of entertainment as, as long as there's money to be made, there will always be some people that choose to skip steps in order to make their money. But I think like you're saying with conversations like this, more people will be able to understand. And I think like as teaching too, like as much as, much as you could know, there's, it always comes down to, you know, you'll never really understand the experience, right? If you're not from, the culture if you're a guest you may you may know like theory but you won't ever understand the feeling so i think you, you'd be able to teach like steps but in terms of like like maybe like afro steps maybe not if that's coming like solely from africa but if it's like hip-hop it's like an amalgamation of like different cultures and different scenarios that more people may be able to like relate to but 
I think it really depends on like the style and also who you, you know, you get your resources from. Yeah, because sorry, personally, what can I, AJ Masodi, tell you about a black trans man, a black trans life? What can I teach you about that? And why do mm-hmm. I want to be the person to teach you about that? Why do yeah, I right? I feel like of leadership when there are people in real life who have that life experience and have the actual stories mm-hmm. to tell, the knowledge to share. So I feel like I, I agree hundred percent with you, Nathan. There are dances. I, I kind of consider it as like the socially acceptable realm of dance where a move is so popular and has been done so many times that it's okay. Like everybody can just mm. use it. It's like your grandma can learn to do it. Like your grandma doing the whip and nene, not appropriation, yeah. it's fine. She's allowed to do it, right? <laughs> there are moves that yeah. are in that realm. And I feel like that's, again, things that are just social and just within our day-to-day and everyone can connect to. But when you start mm. to just take and make it a point to pick out these movements without really understanding it or or just blatantly appropriating a style then then there's that clear difference that maybe you shouldn't be telling that story because again that dance is a story totally totally um sorry can i just follow up um on that on the on my question then uh because um i think Personally, I think we need to prepare ourselves for that world, for the for the possibility that we can be there, because otherwise, what are we working so hard for? Like, why am I working so hard to show you this part about myself if I'll never truly be ready to see you and take that and share it to other people who maybe don't have access to me? Right. Or because of whatever biases they may have, they do not wish to learn from me. And I feel like we should be ready to look past those biases and and believe in ourselves so much that we are ready to see that world. And I'm not trying to dismiss how tricky or convoluted it can get, but the reason why I asked that question is to sort of kind of gauge everybody's uh, stance on that or what they think whether that's possible. So maybe we can hear from some of the other speakers. I think Clement wanted to say something earlier or. Yeah, um, my brain is just going, uh, it's spinning at like a thousand <laughs> spins per second right now. But um, it's, you know, having these conversations, I think it's great, especially um, for me and um, Serge as we get into the space of teaching and um, educating. Uh, because we get to think a lot more, um, at least as much as we dance, you know? Um, Essentially, like, personally growing up um, in my high school, uh, the way we learned dances and moved dances around was, you know, uh, after a holiday break, we'd come back to school and we would dance together, you know, socially interact. You know, one person brings a move, says this is the move, and we all learn it together in a circle, and that was it, you know? Um, but it's getting to a point where, it's like right now, like when we're having these conversations and I'm thinking and I'm like, oh, now it's about thinking more uh, because before it was like dancing and just getting 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 to the dance part. But now it's more about like what AJ was saying, you know, thinking about what what is this dance? What, what, what kind of trauma, what kind of pain, uh, what kind of situations brought this dance to be? Um, and respect and and showing some respect for that, um, and also creating the right environment for that dance style to be to be soaked or to be to be gained from like the people taking the dance class. Um, but at the same time, what Serge said, I think it is it is going to be tough if we if we don't think about this world where we can let go of these dance styles that we hold very dear to ourselves to be able to let other people also take them over and inter- interpret them um, how they how they have experienced them and, and have like this global um, acceptance of, of, of these dance styles that, that we're teaching. I'm, I'm jotting down a lot of things. 
and I'm trying to keep up. You know what I mean? The thoughts are, they're flying. They're just flying. And I'm like, oh, let me say something about that. Okay, so something that came to mind is, well, in dance culture as a whole, in dance class culture, let's make acknowledging a norm and let's make research exciting. As you're sharing, let's, let's have that a part, be a part of the sharing process. There's a lot of power in sharing. Um, we can't be territorial over art. This is something that I have learned. You can't be territorial over art because art is truly for everyone. Now, culture, you know, there are people who, do they own, yeah, you could say they own culture, why? Because they're a part of the culture. Um, and in that regard, you're the host. So be a good host. If someone comes into your home, how do you host them, right? You don't let them run rampant, you, you set some structures, but you invite them in. This is the same thing that we can um, take into our dance sharing as dance teachers. And the last thing I said to Mr. Serge's point is, um, or to your question is, dance is the sweetest form of anthropology, right? Anthropology is the study of human societies and cultures and their development. Let's look at dance like that. And as it expands and, you know, goes to many different people who maybe are not from the culture, let's breathe easy and know that we did our part as hosts, as teachers, because why? We acknowledged and we encouraged our guests to do the research, right? It's gonna spread, it's gonna go. Hello, it's called globalization. It's called technology. Look at how we're having this talk right now. We can't fight it. Sure, there's a lot of trauma and there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of heavy stuff in the history, but you're gonna offer that up. You're gonna offer that up and as a host, I will do my best to teach you how to hold that trauma, whether you are a part, right? If you are in the culture or you're a guest, I will do my best. And then I gotta kinda keep it pushing because art is always evolving and always expanding, right? That's a thought. Can I say something? Yeah, yeah, as a as Serge asked that question, two words jumped out of my head. Uh, the first one being understanding, and the second one being accepting. Right. Um, I'm from Rwanda. We have this traditional dance, basically designed around cows. For us, cows is more more valuable than money. Right. So they designed this dance around cow because of that respect for cows. And I have a sister of mine called Dada that lives in Vancouver. And she grew up dancing to that traditional dance and started her own troop here in Vancouver called Indanga Milk. Because of the lack of black people, she only has white, white people in her troop, right? So she's teaching them that, 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 that traditional dance that they mainly dance into weddings, African weddings, especially around these people, right? And one of those, they were dancing, and one of them is like, they look beautiful doing it, but they don't understand what they're doing. You know what I mean? There's that accepting, I accept that they can do it, and they look beautiful, but she had that, she, don't, she doesn't understand why they're doing that, because the value that she has for cows is not the same thing as those white people doing it. That has for cows, they respect the heaviness of the, the holding the hands and like, holding them like cow, cow cones, you know what I mean? So that's what, that's what, that's why. And that's basically why we are doing what we are doing. It's basically us trying to make you understand who we are, right? Try to, to make you understand who we are so that when you do it, we can accept it because you know that you understand us. Because if you do it without understanding us, it's gonna hurt us, right? It's gonna hurt our feeling like, what are you doing that? You don't understand me, you can't do that. You know what I mean? So at, at, at one point, 
we're gonna get to a point where we accept people doing our things because they understood us. So, that was beautifully, beautifully worded. Thank you for that. Uh, AJ, did you, your hand is raised. Did you wanna say something to that effect? Uh, so that was, yeah, that was really, that was very well said. Um, thank you for mentioning that. Something that um, as I reflect on, on the amazing things that are being said always excites me is I think to instances with my students as we're talking, Sabrina, you mentioned globalization and just how things are gonna spread. And like, that's just, that's the amazing thing. Like as, as a growing artist, I appreciate that because I get to learn things that I probably wouldn't have been in contact with when I was in my bubble, right? And with my students in schools, I always like have conversations with them before we get into dance. And I'll be like, yeah, like those moves that you see on TikTok, like the mop, like that's that's from Houston, Texas. And like the city rock, like that's from Atlanta, Georgia. And like the whip and the nene, that's a real girl named nene from Atlanta. Like I'm letting them know these things and then segueing it into all these kids from these different places who are creating these moves out of their uniqueness, out of their individuality. And you can do the same thing. And like, they're like, oh, like, cool. Like I can really make up my own move. And I'm like, yeah, like you can literally just move your finger like this. And like everybody at the school could be doing it. And you just created a vibe. Like you have the ability to do that because it's your expression. And the reason I value doing that is I want those kids and people to know that, again, you are invited in this house that has been built and you can contribute to it once you understand the values, the etiquette, right? Once you understand the simple house rules, like taking off your shoes before you come into the house, right? As something as simple as that, but we can all already mentally see that if you were to keep your muddy shoes in the house, a mess would be made, right? But as simple as taking off your shoes and already you're able to now hang out in the house and ask for water and like ask for some snacks, you know, you, you get to have a good time. Um, so that's something that's very uh, important for students is again, to know that this different information comes from people expressing themselves. And in turn, that kind of gets you in a safe place to express who you are, because what I've been learning more and more, and this is coming from the choreography aspect and, and doing work with um, competitive dancers, the biggest thing is always confidence and where a dancer stands. Like they always feel like they're, they're standing um, on a shaky foundation, right? They're standing on, on feelings that make them feel like they're not true to themselves or, or not confident as they're dancing or not sure of themselves. And the biggest thing that I always try to instill in my students is to take the time to understand who you are. How can you be sure of yourself if you don't know who you are? Like I'll ask my students, like it doesn't matter the age. I'm like, what's your origins? And people will look at me funny like, what? Like, yeah, what are your origins? What are the amazing things that come together to create the person that you are? from your parents to where they're born, to where you were born, to how many siblings you have, to your grandparents, and maybe they speak a different language, maybe they're from a different country, but really getting to understanding who you are as an individual, which is really the multiple things that come together into making you up as a unique individual. And through that, you start to see what your values are. You start to understand what your personal values are. Yeah, through understanding yourself and understanding what you're about. It's really difficult to understand different cultures and understand different groups if you haven't taken the time to understand yourself. And we all know that to be true in other things. It's hard to love others if you don't love yourself, right? If you don't understand who you are as an individual, again, as simple as your history, right? your background, maybe your family has traditions that they've upheld for years because those are ancestral values that still fall upon you for you to choose if you value those things or not. And that again, helps you understand who you are so that when you go out into the world, when you go out into these classrooms, you can take in this new information and you can explore it and explore it for the sake of understanding and acknowledging someone else's values because you know how important it is for you to have values. And back to Ezel's point, in a classroom, once students are used to doing that, and you can do that in a division one mindset, division two mindset, by simply getting them to acknowledge the students in the class when someone does something different, 
and really, really acknowledging that in the classroom, or if you're working with older students, actually talking about the differences and why people move a certain way. If Mega Man can even chime in, if you're thinking of the style strutting, that style is different based on the fact that the mindset of the dancers who were doing strutting is militant. Everything is militant. And that's because there's a deep connection to the Black Panther era. So the mindset is different. You can't connect to that idea if you're not thinking about that, right? If you're not thinking about that history and what the people were about. So what does that mean for you? When have you had to stand for something that meant a lot to you? And then you can now base that connection off of a value that you actually have and you can acknowledge. So the same way we're unlearning and relearning and unpacking these things in real life, it's the same in dance. You need to come as a person to dance so that you can understand other people. And as teachers, we're trying to inspire our students because this is what I'm picking off of the teachers who have inspired me, they helped me understand who I am and to look deeper into who I am and be proud of that exploration. So now I'm just so curious about everybody else. So that's what I would just um, leave in terms of that. Bro, you asking me to chime in, you already dropped bars, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah, wow, so incredible to hear just so many different perspectives and so eloquently put um, in, in such a wonderful and like honest way and not not beating around the bush about things. Um, if Unless anyone, it didn't seem like anyone wanted to chime in, AJ has a great way of really just like summarizing things so awesomely. Um, I had a, a question, sort of going off what, what a lot of our panelists um, here were talking about earlier, um, like what Isaac mentioned with understanding and making sure that other people have understanding so that when, like Sabrina talked about, the, the globalization and the sharing is not, it's not something that we can fight, it's, it's happening and it can be so beautiful, but how do you make that so it's it's not hurting people. Um, and so it's paying respect to like the pain and the trauma or the joy or whatever it is that those dance styles come from. And so this is a roundabout way. I'm not the most succinct person, but <laughs> bear with me. It will be worth it. Um, when we're talking about, so we've talked about sort of that giving and teaching perspective. I'm curious what people think about when you are entering a space as a guest, like AJ was saying earlier, um, you know, with like the, the voguing and the ballroom, and I don't know if anyone here, I don't think is like super embedded in, in that community, but that was built for the LGBTQ community. It was built for non-binary and trans people. It was built for people who right, were oppressed and, and were under attack by the communities that they lived in. And so how, do we celebrate that and be excited and passionate about it and want to be involved as a guest without overstepping um, or causing pain or making the narrative about ourselves? Um, that's a big question, but that's just kind of where my brain went. I would suggest just giving voices to the people that are the educators, simple as that. Like let them, just give them the voice. Like if I'm a guest in any culture, like we all know hip hop is black culture, but we can go specifically that hip hop is American black culture from specifically New York, the Bronx. Um, and when I was learning it 15 years ago, I was a guest in that culture too, because I didn't know much hip hop, even though I'm black, you know, but I was a guest to the black American experience because I'm Canadian. But I was not speaking on behalf of the Black Americans. I would always, when I, where I did my advanced battle zone, I'd fly out judges here to um, Canada and I'd get them to teach and get them to understand. And, and then while well, they teach me, until they gave me the credit that AJ, you can go and they gave me the pass to go and educate. So it's just how to not step on any toes, in other words, is uplift the originators and the people you're learning from and give them the 
the mic to talk. That is very important. So yeah. Amazing. Yeah, that um, that's very, very succinct and, and so true. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mike Man. Um, Serge, unfortunately, has to go. Um, so I just wanted to give him a, a quick minute to, to say bye and uh, before you head out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, unfortunately, my work day is not yet over. So I do have some something else to get to at the moment. Uh, but I just wanted to thank everybody here uh, for taking the time to listen and taking time to share. And I'd like to um, open myself up to basically anybody either from the audience or from the panel, like, let's keep this conversation growing. And um, I believe, you know, since the last conversation we had, our thoughts have changed a lot. And this is gonna, you know, keep improving those. So it would be good to keep the conversation going and hopefully, you know, looking forward to part three coming soon. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's always a pleasure and so wonderful to have you and to hear from you. Um, so we'll definitely see you again soon. Now oh, everyone's saying thank you in the chat. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, we don't wanna keep you from your work day, but we appreciate you and, uh, and everything you, you've got to offer here. Let me search. Easy. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> I had another question. Unless does anybody from any of our audience members have anything they want to ask? Anything they want to bring up? I know there's been a bit in the chat, but um, otherwise, I'll just. I have a bajillion questions in my brain, but I'm gonna try to encourage if anyone else has something. Say. Yeah, Nika, would you like to chime in? Hi, everyone. Um, okay, this is from like the very beginning. We're talking about plagiarism. What happens if you like catch someone plagiarizing? Do you say something or do you just get a habit? Yo, yo, let me answer this question, please. Please let me answer this question because I've caught many people. Hey, Nika, I'm gonna tell you something. If you, to answer your question, what do you do when you see bullying? You say, no, that's wrong. Don't bully. You defend the person being bullied, you know? So if you see plagiarizing, you say that is wrong. You are plagiarizing, that is not your work. Don't do it. Just like if you saw somebody getting picked on on the street, I would hope <laughs> we'd all have the decency to say something that's not right or go call for help. But if not, yeah, but like that's that's it. You gotta, we can't be afraid of calling it out because if we don't, then it keeps happening. Simple as that. You know, sometimes it's weird because you know why, like you don't know if they even know. You're like, hold on a second. Did we watch the same like, music video by Paris Go Bell and you just happen to copy like two eight counts of her choreo or do you think you actually made that? Right, no, 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 you're 100% right. That is how, what you are just describing is notorious and happens a lot in the choreo dance scene, you know, around the world, you know, you see someone biting and you can, there's, when I mean call them out, now you don't want to call them out like how I would. I'd be blunt in your face, tell you it's wrong. That don't do that. You know that's something I don't recommend. But there's many different ways you can pull the person aside, show them the routine. You you realize this is this looks exactly like this, and you will someone will check you on it. So I think you know there's the or you can message them about it, or you can just say screw it. I'm gonna call them out right in front of them and say, that is biting, you're a thief. Uh, any single one works, um, but some of them will, you know, it comes with repercussions. I'm just not afraid of the repercussions anymore of calling people out and telling them that, yo, you need to check yourself because uh, like I I'm a street dancer. So what I usually say is battle me. And <laughs> that's when they usually just shut up. And, it goes from it goes from there you know but like you you have we have to call them out whether 
it's online and you send them a direct message, whether you, sh you show another teacher, your teacher and say, hey, I've seen this. How do you think I should approach it? Maybe ask that your own teacher to call them out for you. Uh, there's so many different ways, but the, the main thing is you have to call it out. You have to check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> Caitlin, <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking. Thank you. Bad. I actually have nope. also like a comment um, earlier. I can't remember which of the panelists mentioned it, but they're like, do you think we could get past all the biases and like, you know, just one day become an L, I don't even know the word, a combination of all the um, dance culture in the world, everyone being able, yeah, a melting pot kind of, <laughs> just being able to all be under the same dance culture. And I was like, no only because I don't know how long that's going to take, like you said, like a millennia for everyone to get rid of their biases and things like that. But also like some of the biases now are just like, not, I don't even know what the word for what they are. Like if I go up to someone, I'm like, oh, hey, I dance, I'm a dancer. Immediately they're going to be like, so how long have you been doing hip hop? And I'm like, I'm actually like more of a contemporary dancer. So like, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> and it's just interesting. That's Damn. That's tough when someone says, I'd call them out on that. Is it because I'm black you think I'm a hip hop dancer? <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, but damn, that's tough. I'm sorry you had to go through that. But um, I just got to let you guys know uh, I've been on data, and this one, I did not know Zoom, it takes a toll. So I don't have to, <laughs> yeah, I played myself. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to check out because yeah, this is, I looked at my cellular data and I'm like, ooh, so I'm gonna have to check out guys. Um, but thank you for having me Heather at UBC, Dance Horizons. Thank you all for listening. And you know, uh, if you have any questions, you can just hit me up on Instagram, AJ underscore Mega Man or just hit up the other AJ because, you know, AJs always stick together, apple juice for the win. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, peace out, everybody. Thank you so much. We appreciate you so much and for putting your data through all that. We will let you go. It's Love you, bro. Amazing. Thank you so, so much. Man. No problem. Cheers. Cheers everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Um, I would love to add a thought to Nika's um, question about plagiarism. So plagiarism is terrible. We know it. And um, it's actually quite heartbreaking. Now, what I've also witnessed as a dance instructor um, is that sometimes there's a very blurry line between plagiarism and reference. So I think as artists, we are more than welcome to reference, to have reference points. Um, but it becomes tricky when, you know, you're literally biting. So um, like I mentioned earlier about conversation, I think those call outs can be conversations because sometimes those call outs can turn a little confrontational and they can be a little bit, um, uncomfortable. But if you find yourself in that moment where you're a witness to something that you're like, you know what, I think this is plagiarism. I think that that is a fantastic opportunity for conversation. And um, inviting the person who has maybe done the plagiarism to really think about how they are referencing where they're coming from. Um, I just know that those types of conversations can be kind of awkward and like I said, confrontational, but don't let that uh, deter you in any way. I think dance and art is, it's all about conversation because maybe they just didn't see it like that. And you can be the person to educate them or to enlighten them, right? Um, we need to remember that dance this is a community thing. This is a community sport. Um, and especially these social dances, this is social, right? So sometimes these wars, people like to war all the time. You know what? 
easy. Let's have a conversation and um, let's really pinpoint, are you trying to reference or are you fully fighting? Because there can be a blurry line. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, to move um, genres and styles forward, it's awesome to reference history, right? I do that a lot in my jazz work, right? There's a lot of, oh, and here comes my friend just said, yeah, ch thank you very much. Um, Kayla Tkeste, hey, hey, let's go. Big dance, uh, Calgary vibes here, let's go. <laughs> yes, um, what I'm saying is that, you know, especially if you're a part of a style that has history and has lineage, you must reference the, the past to really um, innovate what's happening presently and move the style forward. So I guess what I'm really trying to say is let's acknowledge the difference between reference and plagiarism. And if we can truly confirm that it is plagiarism, let's dive into a conversation around that because maybe people just don't know, right? Uh, to bounce off that, that's cool. Um, I 100% agree uh, with what Sabrina just said because I think a really, really important part, um, even if we're just talking about hip hop, is that within the music, within rap, within dance, like it's been alive because of that concept of remixing and sampling and paying homage. So in rap, you'll often hear bar for bar renditions of something a rapper from another generation has said infused in another way that's contextual to that artist, right? So like that, that is something that is done in hip hop. So that's where I, I wanna make that connection to what Sabrina just said. That's an amazing time to have a conversation on what influences and how they're paying homage to uh, what you've noticed or the connections that you've made. Asking a dancer like, oh, I like how you paid homage to this, 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 and having that conversation. Or even if it's a teaching moment, teaching them how to correctly pay homage to a style and how to correctly interject that within your dance. Because I think something that's very important, especially when we're thinking about a uh, choreography scene. I, I grew up as a, as a choreography dancer. Um, I did a lot of that. We, we really have to understand that a lot of the times when you see things like that, or even the concept of looking like everyone else breeds a lack of self-confidence at times if you're not working on that actively because you're consistently trying to be like somebody else. You're consistently trying to move like someone else. Now, the beauty of that is if you have if you have a different understanding of choreography and you get to find yourself, you have an understanding of yourself, then we're back to that first conversation. You can take in information and remember who you are and how you deal with the information that you're, you're, you're gaining. How does it apply to you? But if you're not learning who you are, then you're defined by these movements. And when you're choreographing, it's very easy for people to fall in this realm of what the idea of choreography is today is what they're going to try to replicate in their movement because that's what's accepted that's what's seen I, I, i'm trying to like make sense out of it as i'm saying it but what the norm is for choreography tends to be the fallback for students that are feeling like maybe i don't i don't have what it takes to choreograph as an individual so I think that's another beautiful moment to take that vulnerability and inspire someone or sorry, uplift someone by letting them know, hey, in those moments where you're doing improv or freestyle, I love seeing your individual style. And when you're interjecting influences from other artists, like here's a way that you could do that where you aren't, or so where you're fully giving credit to that artist that you're inspired by. So as a leader, you could take that position and inspire. But yeah, I, I'm kind of just giving more ways to have that conversation as Sabrina was saying, because to me, those are all opportunities to uplift each other because at the end of the day, I remember that I was a lost dancer as well. I thought that this was like, the dubstep stuff was like it, but I didn't understand that like there's techniques to it. I didn't understand that hip hop had moves to it. I didn't even understand that my cultural dances when I was going to cultural parties, like I was just taking it in because I was there, but I didn't really understand it until I started to look into it and I fell in love with it. 
are you going to prosecute me for being a kid that doesn't know what's going on? Like, no, you know what I mean? No, we're just, we're just humans. But that's a beautiful opportunity to lead someone to be inspired to do the research and inspired to do things ethically. You know what I mean? Like I always tell some of my homies like that want to do dance full time. I'm like, yo, you don't have to wave away from your path to do what you want to do. But at the end of the day, do you want the OGs and the people who were in love with the style and people are part of the community to respect you? Or do you want your financial gain to respect you? At the end of the day, on your, on your last days, if you really love it, the answer is simple. You want the community that you are a part of, right? That's, that's what you care about. Every, everything else is just here to stay on earth when you leave it. But your connection to that community, the impact that you leave in that community is there forever, right? So at the end of the day, which side do you wanna be? And that, that can be, um, again, just, just a really good way to have conversations with people and inspire them to do that thinking. I think so, kind of bouncing off of what Sav says. Throw it to Clement. When it kind of gets to me, I feel like my mind has just thought of like a thousand other things. Okay, um, uh, let me try to find. Uh, first of all, let me just go back to the idea of like plagiarizing and what Nico said. Uh, Sabrina and Jay, uh, Jay as well. Um, I think being a person who like watches like, I don't know, a thousand videos a day, dance videos a day, I am guilty of this. I don't know if it's called, we'd call it plagiarizing, but um, sometimes my head sees a move somewhere and I start doing it and it feels very original. And I feel like, ah, you know, I've, I've been doing this and it's it's something that I've done. So I could take a section of a choreography somewhere um, and interpret it in a different way, but section it out. And I think in terms of dance and music and just what AJ just said, I feel like it's something that is meant to happen. You know, there's like so many ways you can move your body. So it's always remixing and everything we do is just a remix of something else really. Um, so it's, when when it, it, it all also comes down to intentionality right like what are your intentions right um and sometimes questioning yourself and being like what 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 were my intentions when i was doing this piece right um and at the same time like always questioning where things come from right and we have to understand that it's okay to be wrong i feel like sometimes when we have these chats um i i, I hope no one else gets this but Sometimes I'm scared. I'm like, should I ever try to do this style? Should I ever try to do this sudden dance style? Or should I ever try to do these moves? Uh, because it feels scary at some point. You're like, are they gonna call me out? Like, you know, like every time, some, like most of the time when I'm on Instagram, there's always someone calling someone out. Like, oh, you know, TikTok dancers are destroying this cultural dance and all that. Like there's someone calling someone out, right? Um, and I don't know, I feel like this is a question I'll probably pose to the, to the um, panel as well, is like finding the balance between like if people are celebrating that style, even if they're doing it the wrong way, right? Um, if, they, if, they, if that's how they try, that's the most they can do, like if they're trying to do it. Um, and also understanding if they don't care about the dance style and they're trying to just go with the wave, you know, like, because everyone is doing it and everyone is looking like, this is the dope thing to do now. So let's all do it. Um, I just want to know if there's a way to create that safe space around cultural dances um, so that people don't feel scared uh, to, to try things out um, because they'll, they're gonna be called out. Um, and also that I think ties in with intentionality, like when should you feel okay to try something and not be scared to, to, to be wrong at it? Um, I don't know, I'm all over the place, but I, I hope you guys are getting this. Can I just say something really quickly? Cause I can feel it, AJ, I can feel it. You, you, you're coming in with something hot, I can feel it. So super quickly, what I'll say, when I heard you say the word fear, it made me think of cancel, cancel culture stop it, try something new, go for it. What is the one thing that will cure cancel culture is curiosity. And underneath your curiosity, have a clear intention. And I think 
there's just, there's only winnings. There's only winnings available to you. If your intention is clear and you stay curious, don't fear trying something new. How do we progress as artists and as a society and as a species if we're just, oh my God, cancel culture. Oh, it's gonna come and get me. Cancel, cancel culture, stay curious then have a clear, positive intention. Just, just to, to add to that, um, so how do we as instructors create that space, right? Um, Invitations. Right, I think right. we invite. We also, as hosts, as you know, this word instructor, yes, that's the job title, but as hosts of the culture and of the style, be secure in who you are and in your teaching and know that you're there to share. And like I said in the past, you know, you make you, you make acknowledging a part of your class structure, you make research exciting for your students and invite so that they know, okay, I can try. And you know what, because you're such a secure host, you're gonna call them out if they trip up and they do something crazy or they don't act as an appropriate guest, right? It's a lot of work to be an instructor, to be a host, right? But I think it also starts with the invitation and then the student to be curious. And if there's failure involved, that's okay, that's art. We fail in art all the time. Oh my God, if we didn't fail, we wouldn't be anywhere, right? So it's, it's a two-sided thing, it's a relationship. Someone has to invite and someone has to be curious. I don't know, do you guys have any thoughts? I love that. Someone has to invite and someone has to be curious. I jotted that down and being a good host. I think, um, something that helps me think about it is you, we should not be afraid to explore and to try things out. And maybe this was lost in conversation or maybe everyone is fully aware of this. I don't know, cause I had to think about it for a sec, but this is solely if you are being paid and you are in a position where you have, like you put yourself in that position of, I am telling the story and I'm being compensated to tell that story because now the severity of your actions is, is that appropriation. I don't believe that if you are just someone who loves to dance and you're exploring and you're taking the classes and you're in the ciphers and you're in the sessions that you're doing anything wrong because that's the point is to be curious. You could even have a program outdoors where you invite people to come dance this style that you love but you do it for free. Now you are really a host of a space that is safe for students to experience this dance. Why do you need to financially benefit off of that story? And if you do feel like you wanna make that your stream of income, then there's no wavering around it. You need to have the experience to tell that story. The same way I want my doctor to have the experience, the same way I want my, my like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't have to get into it, but you guys get what I'm saying, right? But when my homie wants to tell me health advice, I'll listen to him because we're homies. I want to listen to his new diet, but I'll see a specialist if something's wrong with me, if I'm paying money to it, if my life is on the line, you know what I mean? So there's nothing wrong with the exploration. Like, I'm the type of person, if I was to screen share my notes, like, I dive down to, like, almost as many states as I can, what dance style they do, the music, the genre, when it started, why? I will probably never explore that dance style in a physical form, but I just love to know about it and to know about the people. And there's dance styles that I will never be able to teach to anyone. One, because I'm probably never gonna be that good at it. And two, because it's special to me. And I don't think as, I think as artists, we have attached um, dancing, and creating and teaching with with our jobs and, and how we and how we keep feeding ourselves and keeping ourselves alive which makes sense especially if you have a business especially if you're doing this full time but now it's really thinking about this new information that you're taking in and the information that you're trying to solidify or go back on and to strengthen right if you are already teaching a style then being a practitioner is the key consistently involving yourself in the community 
is the key being there like in the trenches actually being there physically because you're already teaching and if you haven't yet started teaching then taking more time just being in those communities and inviting people to create that space out of the goodness of your heart but i believe that once you take money for it you are now in a position where you are pushing that movement and you are the leader which as sabrina said the responsibilities are big and it's amazing it's beautiful but it's a lot so are you ready for that? Is that something that you want, right? And if it is, then it's a long journey, an endless journey. And something that should, that's something that should excite you. Like it's something that, that should really, really um, get you going. I know it gets me really, really happy, especially when I see these other panelists and um, as AJ and Serge were just in here, same thing, like that, that inspires me to see how they're taking it in their depth and knowing that I'm learning off of that just as much and learning off of you guys who are asking questions. And maybe we'll cross paths in the dance in the dance world, right? But that's that's what we're here to do. So, if I was to just to add on to that, I really really like your idea of being a good host, Sabrina. That's a really good way of thinking about it. Yeah, being a good host. Amazing, amazing. Um, I'm gonna put it out again to any of our audience members if they have questions. Onika's got a great one in the chat here. She says, how do you make learning fun? It's a good instructor question. As in research, okay, that we were talking about before with, um, yeah. How, like, what are, I guess maybe, Nika, I don't know, you can speak on it, but are you looking for like, what more kind of concrete things do you do to inspire that in, in your students? I don't students? know, I don't know, like just to not give people like a worksheet, so it's not like homework. What age group are we talking? Just, just to, yeah. All of them. <laughs> I mean, right now we're university students, so I guess university age. Well, I mean, I can only speak from an instructor's point of view, because when I look back as a student, I mean, I, I was very excited about dance and certain things. So I kind of naturally was um, into knowing about the history. And I thought it was really awesome that like there was a whole theory part of dance class. I thought that was really cool. Um, but as a teacher, I think it kind of just has to be like right in right in there with your offering and your inviting and your teaching. Um, this cool move, here it is. Go look up who made it. Um, I don't know, you know, there are so many different ways you can keep it super conversational. You could say it's by so-and-so come back next class, tell me a little bit about this person. Like, there's so many ways to get people engaged and excited about the history. And also showing that you're excited too, I think is also really important. Um, you know, we see it all the time with little kids. If you walk in as a teacher and your energy is down and you're just like, oh Lord, I gotta do this little combo again. You know, the child feels that. And so then they kind of pull away and they start running around. But if you are super engaged, well, it's like, it's like a magnet, right? So the same thing with adults, showing them that like, this is it, this is a part of me, come with me, learn about this. We only have 60 minutes, but check this out. You do more. There's years of information attached to this. That's something that comes to mind. I don't know, what about, what about the fellas? What do you think? Uh, I don't think learning anything can be fun. Like any, any type of learning, it's horrible. It's bad, it's uncomfortable, which yeah. is why school, no one likes like school, right? Because it's a place where you go to learn, but uh, and like a hack or yeah, a simple way to make learning fun is to relearn what you already know. That makes a little bit interesting, a little bit fun because you already know what you're doing, so it's kind of like feels a little bit fun, 
right? So find something that you enjoy, a, a combo that you already learned, a, a, a groove that you already love and repeatedly groo groove on it, research it, see its origin, find a way to do it differently. That's an easy way to make it fun. But it's, it's, it's not supposed to be fun because that's the process of learning. It's, it's the struggle, it's the difficulty, it's the failure. That's why it's learning, right? It can be fun. That's my opinion. Thank you for telling us how you really feel. I love that. I love that. Like, Thanks. let's get it going. <laughs> um, yeah, AJ, do you want to take it away there first? Yeah, um, this is my last answer because I got a jet, unfortunately. So I just want to thank everyone. Thank you, Dance Horizons. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Thank you, amazing speakers. Wow. Um, yeah, like every time, every time I get to hear, uh, especially Sabrina, Nizo hearing you speak today, Sinbirds, one half of Sinbirds and the full half of Sinbirds, too. Um, there's always so many amazing things to hear because, again, the stories that we learn from others is what gives us that insight to really understand ourselves. So I appreciate you guys for making me look deeper within myself and finding new things. Um, to kind of go off of that question of making learning fun, I've been trying to lead, I'll give you guys an example that I use with little kids and then I'll kind of loop around to why. Uh, when I wanna teach kids, and I, I'll do this with like grade two, gotta be a little, a little cognitive up there, a little more cognitive up there, grade twos, to like, um, to like grade seven, grade eight. Um, what I like to do is I'll play this game with them and it's literally like dancing telephone. Yeah, especially with like COVID restrictions, like they're already in their little groups and their little hubs, so it depends. But what I'll do is I'll get them to stand in line and then I'll explain to them that the front person of each line is going to watch me. I'm gonna give them a sequence of moves. We're gonna pass it down the line. You're gonna teach your friend the sequence of moves until it makes it to the end. And we're gonna see what that move looks like. And they're gonna be like, oh, that's like telephone. And I'm like, yeah. If you're thinking about cultural dances, those are traditions that have been passed down generation and generation by ancestors. So we are going to do that and we're gonna see what happens. So we play it, I play music, I show the three moves, they pass it down at the end, it looks nothing like the first move of course not right like it's something is going to change in translation but i let them know at the end that no one was wrong you only did what you were taught so you did your job and you passed it on to the next person but the value here is to be attentive to what you were taught and to look for those little details so that you can pass it on to the next person so they can fully get it or fully enjoy it so i like to take lessons and i think once you step away from trying to make the process of like like isa was saying learning dance fun when you make it more so of like learning about yourself then it makes it matter for people so they can find the fun in it if i'm in a class and i'm stressed and i'm uncomfortable I'm not thinking about the fun because I'm thinking about the feelings I have. But if as a teacher, we're making the space comfortable, uplifting everyone by seeing them, seeing their differences. Yo, your hair looks awesome today. That's a cool vibe. I like how you were doing that one shoulder thing. You in your head, you know that that is not a part of the technique, but that's still something that's different. And you uplift that person for that difference and you take that time then it starts to matter a little more for people. So I think once we find ways to connect with people a little more, then the dance and what you bring into the classroom will be fun because instinctively the process will just be fun. And that also comes with what Sabrina was saying earlier of taking that time to be a practitioner of that style. Because if you are actively working in that style, whatever is getting you excited, that's what you're gonna share for others to be excited. You know what I mean? If I'm excited about how much an orange tastes good, like I just want you to know how much that orange tastes good. And I want you to try the orange. But if I've never had an orange, I can't lie to you. I could be like, it's sweet. And you're like, like Sour Patch Kids? I'm like, no, it's like a little more tart. And you're like, like a lemon? I'm like, nah, okay, it's like, you know what I mean? We're gonna be there all day. If I experience it consistently, then I can tell you it's a juicy fruit and the flavors are, we could go on. You know what I mean? I can make you excited about it. So the way I think about it is connecting to my students and what matters to them, right? What matters to your students. If I'm working with junior high kids, I let them know that I know what's happening, that I know what's up, I know what's current. And that's your job as someone who's reflecting the times, as an artist, Nina Simone, reflecting the times, yeah? 
So I, I really, really think, again, it's taking that time to connect with your students and naturally the lessons that you bring in will be more interesting because they will matter more. And I leave you guys with that. Thank you so, so much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much, AJ. Always, always a wealth of knowledge more. Like we are so, so privileged to have you. Thank you so much for carving time. I, I learned so, so much. So I'm really grateful for this time. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, everyone. Peace. Thank you. Much love. Wow, 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 so awesome. Amazing. Sorry, I'm just, I'm processing. I don't know about anybody else, but <laughs> lots of, lots of fantastic stuff. Um, yeah. Panelists, do you look, Sabrina looks like she's thinking. I don't know. Yeah, I wanted to, you know, I'm thinking about your question, Nika. Nika, like, do you mean, you know, for you specifically, like? No, I like the research stuff. I love Googling stuff. Mm -hmm. But like, sometimes when you think something's exciting, you're like, whoa, both these moves came from the Bronx. Can you believe someone else is like, okay, so can you show me how to do it? But like, you want to talk about the history? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something that also came to mind is like, it's not for everyone. And that's okay. And maybe that's your shtick. That's your thing. You love the history of movement. And it's unfortunate that maybe not everyone's on that bandwagon, but you know, like still go for it. If someone was experiencing, um, I don't know, like if they were not having fun researching, you know, and they were an, a more mature student like yourself, I would also invite them to just kind of zoom out a little bit. Like, I remember I was doing, I was researching things about modern dance companies and I was like, okay, this is great, but I, like my soul is not ignited with this information, but, you know, I just had to zoom out a little bit and maybe just learn about dance as a whole versus like the specific company, the specific choreographer, you can kind of learn about how dance works. Sometimes if you just broaden your perspective while you research, you'll find something to anchor you within that. And then that can invite you back in to getting excited. Um, you, not necessarily you, Nika, but the student who's maybe feeling like, oh gosh, I have to research this thing. Zoom out a little bit, find something that can bring you back in. Mm -hmm. To, to, add, to add to that, um, I feel like most of the frustration that comes with like research is not knowing the resources or where to find the information. Um, so, I mean, as an instructor, I think maybe providing these resources, you know, giving them like a guidance to find the resource um, because like anything, like in class, if you have a paper to write, it's always like, ah, what am I gonna, you know, go to Google Scholar, find the things that are like, you know, that have been peer reviewed. Like, you know, it's, it's a stressful thing to do to find the, the, the appropriate resources to give you the information that you need. Um, so I think personally, like when I'm thinking about this now, I probably, I'm thinking, you know, as I go forward with like being an instructor, it's more of like, you know, creating a resource, you know, giving, having, having some sort of like um, uh, URL, some websites, uh, some place that has the information, maybe typing it out and having it ready um, for people that want to learn more um, or just people who are in class so that they can have that opportunity to have the information ready and all they have to do is read it, um, which is not going to make it so exciting, but it's going to make the burden of you trying to find that information less um, and give you like a head start on what where to where to start and look. I don't want to chime too much in on this because it's not my area of expertise and the question was not directed at me. But um, from I don't know from a, a student perspective, I think even if you I don't know if this is at all helpful to you, Nika, but when when Sabrina like was talking earlier and and AJ and uh, Clement and Isa were also talking about it 
when you know yourself and you know your history and you're excited, which Nika, like I've seen you teach and you are, um, like you become a resource almost in and of yourself. I don't know if that's like, that's not really const like constructive stuff to answer the question, but I don't know if, if people disagree with me on that, but I think, you know, like taking class from somebody, you know, like if I were to take class from Clement or Izo or Sabrina, like maybe sometimes if people don't fully understand right there, the things that you say and that you share might be sticking with them more than you think. Um, that would be my hope. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm some green. <laughs> um, wonderful. Well, um, last time that we had this panel, it went way a little bit over time and I don't want to make people do that again because I know we are all tired of being online and being on the internet as much as we could listen to our speakers talk all day. I like really, really could. Um, and I think like, based on the faces I see, a lot of people are still bright eyed and bushy tailed. So that's awesome. Um, but I don't wanna hold people for too long. So um, we'll do a, some little wrap ups. Did anyone have any sort of last things that they wanted to impart for any of our speakers or, or anyone else? <laughs> just smiles, just grinning face. Hi there. Can you guys hear me? Oh, yep. Yeah. Hi, my name is Rachel. Sorry, I don't have a camera, so um, I don't want to say much. Uh, I just want to say this has been very enlightening and informative, and I've really appreciated listening to all these amazing young people uh, who are our future. So thank you so much. It's been a privilege. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, super unofficial, but that is my mom and um, so <laughs> very nice of her to be here. Um, wonderful, Izo, your uh, hand is a little raised here. Did you have something else you wanted to chime in? Or I don't know if that was an accidental hand raise. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I've been on the other side for a very long time now. So I don't know how to be like a advanced student anymore. So I have a question for our students here. Because for me, when, uh, when I was taking class, um uh, i used to think that a class is somewhere you go not just to learn like moves right now i mean not just to go there do some steps and go home it's a place where i get to get information about the movement the history about the movement i get to walk out i get to, to do some conditioning you know what i mean it's a gym it's a lecture it's a dance class it's all that good stuff so i want to know the uh, the idea of a dance class these days. Sorry, so was your question? My question is, uh, what's, what's, what's a dance class? When, when they define a dance class in their head, what are they expecting when they walk into a dance class? Awesome. Good question. Um, that's great. Uh, Jonathan, I see, has his hand raised. Did you want to chime in? Yeah, um, as a person that's pretty not pretty um, noobish in dance and stuff like that I I think what you're saying is still very accurate like uh, especially with with my experience with dance horizons for maybe five as long as other two which is crazy to me um, it, it is all, all those mixes of that of like um, conditioning and learning moves but like what I've really liked about especially from dance rights is, is a lot of a lot of we have a lot of instructors like you guys adding that little extra of like oh this this move is from here and and like how to like interact with the community and like get, gain us more confident in like socializing and being part of the culture and and I think um all of that makes it really great <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for chiming in there, John. Um, yeah, that was fantastic. It's super nice to see you here. Um, yeah, I think so much of, of what you, our panelists have touched on has is like what, what a dance class is, whether that class is happening outside in a circle of your friends or whether that class is, you know, a formal setting. 
Isaac, like Isaac, like you said, it's it really is. It's a lecture. It's it's community. It's passion. It's exercise. It's entertainment. It's love. It's history. It's ancestry. It's all of these things. And the little AJ's little melting pot symbol <laughs> that he was doing. Um, and uh, I don't know if that's just that's just me sort of amalgamating what other people have said. Um, but I think uh, I think that's a beautiful way to to look at it. I hope that did that answer your question. Nobody else really had a hand up, but yeah, he's nodding. Perfect. Um, oh yes, Katie. I guess I just wanted to add like another opinion for the answer, which is I would I don't know. I feel like it's hard to like just explain because you know in a way it's really like about the vibes, you know, as abstract as that is, you know, we all have different interpretations of it. But I think for me, dance class is really like to learn, <laughs> but in a fun way that it's like, you're not just learning like whatever the routine is that the teachers, like the actual moves themselves, like you're learning like the culture of the dance, but also learning like, I feel like really the specific nuances that like each teacher has that they bring to the table. Like when you're just in that environment, you know, you have a lot that you can learn of just like, I don't know, even in the way of like how they explain things, like sometimes even like, you know, the specific sound effects that different teachers use, like there's a lot of different ones, even when you're not counting. And I think even that is like, you take little pieces of that from each class you're in along with the people that you take the class with. And it's all just like, that learning experience together of like, you know, it's not just one big piece, but it's like all those little pieces. It's like the more classes you go to, just all that together. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. That was beautifully put, Katie. Thank you for sharing. That was awesome. Um, great. We are so sorry. I said we wouldn't go over time. We are at seven o'clock. Um, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you. I know we've lost half our panelists um, for various reasons, but thank you to AJ and um, AJ Megaman and Serge, as well as our panelists here, Clement and Izo and Sabrina. We appreciate you so much taking the time out of your lives to like be here and have this conversation. Um, just a big round of applause. You are always so, so amazing to chat with and to hear from and to, the energy is just so wonderful. So we really thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Um, and I thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm not gonna get emotional. Um, yeah, and, and thank you for our audience members. I know you're all tired as well. It's a hard, it's been a hard year. And so thank you for showing up for yourselves and for your community and, and for each other and to hear from our incredible speakers like give yourselves a round of applause too. Um, all our official, like thank you for the Dance Horizons exec team, um, specifically Campbell for helping me out today doing some moderating. Um, thank you to our sponsors. I'll touch on that in a sec as well. Um, unofficial thank you to my roommate, Andrea, who's here. She told me not to thank her, she's gonna hide, but she has been, uh, I've been bouncing all my ideas and emails and everything off of her. So she's been a very great uh, unofficial help in this and deserves some credibility. Um, yeah, and lastly, thank you to me for doing the work to put this together. I think it's important we recognize ourselves. Um, <laughs> I encourage you to do that for yourself when you do when you do things you're you're happy about. Um, yeah, I won't hold you too much longer. I did mention at the beginning I put a little tiny kahoot together, so we'll stop the recording if you want to participate in that. It's just like ten questions of little dance trivia's that I. Googled and, and were in my brain and a little bit of research that I did. Um, it's really fun. And there's a little prize at the end for, for the winner. So um, I will tell you what that prize is, but we can stop recording for now. So yeah, I just wanted to do a big wrap, big wrap up and thank you so much to everybody for being here. This has been Exploring Dance Culture 2.0 and we can't wait for 3.0 and 4.0 and all the point .0s to come. Um, yeah, our future president is nodding. She loves these and she's super on board. So we're really happy about it. Um, yeah, thank you again to our, our speakers, especially. Really appreciate you being here.